Welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, we're very excited about today because we have a very good Hume collection and so this is a chance to hear from a real um, expert in the field and because I'm not an expert in the field we've actually asked Professor Brian Cowan from the Department of History to introduce our speaker today but welcome to ROAR and the sixth of ten ROAR talks this term. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Markowski from Liverpool University, uh, who will be speaking to us today on reading Hume in 18th century Britain and North America. Uh, Mark uh, studied at the University of St. Andrews as an undergraduate and doing his postdoctoral uh, studies, completing his doctorate in 2007. After a year at the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London, as the Past and Present Society's postdoctoral fellow, he arrived in Liverpool in October 2008, and he's been there more or less ever since. Uh, he's primarily interested in the history of reading in the 18th and the 19th centuries, using the practice and experience of reading in the past as a key to understanding the broader social and cultural processes across the English-speaking world. So this research agenda was pioneered in his first monograph on the social impact of the Enlightenment in Scotland, a really great book entitled Reading the Scottish Enlightenment, Books and Their Readers in Provincial Scotland, 1750 to 1820. He has, uh, since publishing this book, broadened out his interests to include published research on the cultural history of libraries, he has forthcoming um, work uh, in, in that field, the reading experiences of Napoleonic prisoners of war, and the history of women's reading. Uh, I've had the privilege to begin uh, reading his uh, draft monograph in progress entitled Reading History in 18th Century Britain and North America. Uh, funded by a British Academy Mid-Career Fellowship, and I believe today's talk is uh, based on much of that research. Uh, so we're very pleased to have Mark here and to speak to us today. Uh, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to his, his talk. Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction and introductions, and thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I've had a um, really wonderful time the last few days exploring the collection, uh, meeting some of Brian's students very early on this morning, um, and enjoying the, the, the experience of being at McGill um, and the experience to work on such a fantastic collection. Particularly want to thank Anne Marie, um, who's, who's spent um, so much time with me the last few days sort of um, finding things and uh, talking through through them with me as uh, as she's been putting through together the exhibition um, next door um, <clears throat> so David Hume um, one of the things that's very striking about him um, as as an author celebrated ph philosopher um, perhaps even more in his own time celebrated historian um, is that he was an obsessive reviser of the books that he wrote. He was constantly writing to his publishers to update his texts, uh, correct typographical errors, and add nuance to the analysis. And one of the wonderful um, advantages of having such an extensive collection that you have here is that you can trace some of those, um, those, those textual changes as they develop uh, across the editions. Um, so as one of the final acts of revision before his death uh, in 1776, Hume wrote to his publishers with a short autobiographical account of his own life, which he indicated uh, should preface every future edition of his best-selling History of England. And this is a 1782 uh, edition from the McGill collection, and you can see picked out um, at the bottom of the title page there as to which is prefixed a short account of his life written by himself. And when subsequent readers therefore started this book and opened this book, one of the very first things they read was Hume's downbeat account of its initial reception. But miserable was my disappointment, he said. I was assailed by one cry of reproach, disapprobation, and even detestation. English, Scotch and Irish, Whig and Tory, churchman and sectary, freethinker and religionist, patriot and courtier, united in their rage against the man who had presumed to shed a generous tear 
for the fate of Charles I and the Earl of Strafford. Um, Hume's assessment of the miserable response to the first volume of his History of England uh, presents historians of reading with something of a conundrum. And it's a conundrum I've been picking up pretty much ever since I, uh, I started my PhD. The full range of criticisms outlined by Hume can be found in abundance in contemporary reading notes, with readers' opposition to his perceived irreligion, alleged atheism, and peculiar politics spilling over into correspondence, uh, conversations, and heated debates in local taverns and inns. But by the time he came to write his own life, and he acknowledges this uh, perfectly well later on in the autobiography, Hume could well afford to dwell on the history's poor reception in such frank and characteristically playful terms. Far from sinking into oblivion, as he suggests, it had quickly become a preeminent account of the English past, as well as one of the most commercially successful publishing projects of the Georgian age. So what I'm going to do today is reflect a little bit more on the reception of Hume's history, uh, thinking about what Hume's readers did with the book, uh, and ultimately why he was so keen, why he might have been so keen, to preface their encounter with it in this way. And in doing so, I'm going to suggest that Hume's history provides a fascinating case study in 18th century reading habits, uh, arguing that even though Hume's history was very widely read, his underlying arguments were appropriated, mutated, distorted by readers, motivated by differing cultural, social and political priorities. Readers who encountered Hume's books uh, and Hume's history in very diff different geographical and temporal contexts, and who necessarily therefore start to adapt his narratives about English history for their own times and places. Um, and as Brian said in introducing the talk, this is uh, part of a wider book project uh, on history reading in the 18th century, and hopefully very shortly I'll have a second positive peer review uh, report, so, so it will be forthcoming rather than in draft. Um, and the book uh, looks at landmark historical works by the likes of Hume, but also Gibbon, Robertson, Ferguson, Keynes, many others, um, not as central components of Enlightenment thought as they're often treated by intellectual historians, and usually treated by intellectual historians, but as material texts uh, that are encountered by readers daily and in the course of everyday life. They're providing basic historical information that serves either to reinforce or to change how they view the world around them. Um, and looking more closely at how they use history books, I suggest, can allow us uh, an exceptionally rare glimpse into how ordinary readers um, are engaging through their reading with some of the great movements and upheavals of the age. And hopefully by the end of the paper you'll have a sense of what I'm, I'm doing in the wider book. In the first place, uh, as the author was himself very uh, well aware, Hume's prior publishing career as a sceptical philosopher <coughs> potentially threatened how his history might perform. When it first came out, the work faced a barrage of criticism for its dismissive approach to the agency of religious faith in English history and its sometimes scathing criticism of leading religious figures. And this is our, the argument of a, a, a scholarly commentary uh, by a clergyman called Daniel McQueen in his letters on Mr. Hume's history of Great Britain uh, pick out specific passages where he feels that Hume has uh, denigrated um, religious uh, figures. This again is from uh, McGill Collection, and you can see see this next door with the uh, with the 18th century smiley on the inscription on the left hand side. Um, this is a scholarly commentary, but this sort of reception also feeds into the popular press. So, one of the very early uh, critical uh, reviews published in the Monthly Review by Roger Flexman um, uh, savages um, Hume's. Um, uh, notions of religion. He seems to be of opinion that there are but two species, superstition and fanaticism. Um, and the whole of the Christian profession is and ever was included under these heads. His treatment of every denomination of Christians to speak the most favourably is far from being such as becomes a gentleman and may we apprehend prejudice his reputation even as a historian in the opinion of many intelligent and considerate uh, readers. 
Um, these uh, printed reviews by professional readers uh, undoubtedly had a formative influence on the responses of Hume's initial readers. So this is from a contemporary commonplace book uh, with an anonymous uh, author uh, called Amusements in Solitude. Um, and we can see at the bottom of this, um, this manuscript note on, on Hume um, a very clear echo of one of Flexman's arguments. This makes it evident to me that there is no being a good historian without being so far a divine as to have a regard for religion. And in fact, this reader goes on to say that there's nothing more shocking than Hume's account of the Reformation. He owns it to be one of the greatest events in history, but then says that reason has no share in it, never mind um, divine revelation. Um, uh, it's fortune, uh, chance, nature, venerable names, off without meaning, are frequently found with him. But still, this great event appears in effect without a cause. Did not the passions, follies, and vices of mankind come to our author's assistance and finish the work? Can anything be more absurd than this account, expressive of the most impious sentiments, devoid of common sense? Now, uh, the anonymous compiler of this commonplace book, Amusements in Solitude, cannot swiftly be discounted as an evangelical bigot, uninterested in polite letters more generally. The final sentence where she mentions the, the common sense um, gestures towards uh, the common sense school of Thomas Reed and James Beattie, who were amongst Hume's most influential philosophical opponents. And in much of the rest of the commonplace book, um, she talked quite a lot about William Robertson's histories. Um, and, and he comes across as very much her favourite author, someone who affords a proof in fact of the necessity of a divine revelation. Um, and indeed, um, Amusements in Solitude tallies with an awful lot of the original manuscript responses to Hume, uh, who, who were responding to, to uh, his problems, um, his attitude towards religious figures in similar ways. Now, Hume himself believed that he had succeeded in neutralising the impact uh, of some of his unorthodox views. Writing, writing candidly to a friend that a few Christians only think I speak like a libertine in religion, be it assured I am tolerably reserved on this head. But when the reviewers like Flexman and McQueen proceeded to attack the first edition on religious grounds, Hume acted swiftly and decisively to diffuse the potentially disastrous effect their commentary might have on the work's commercial performance. So he issued detailed instructions to his publishers with the revisions designed to tone down the text still further and including the complete removal of two lengthy passages that had caused the greatest offence and that the Queen talked about in the letters of him. And as a result of these uh, revisions and changes to the text, subsequent readers who were aware of Hume's reputation as an atheist, not least by reading hostile reviews, had a difficult time equating his reputation with what they actually saw in front of them in the history of England. Um, and this is just one example. So these, um, these images are from uh, a copy of one of these later editions which, uh, from which the, the offensive material has been cut. Um, and this has been very heavily annotated by readers at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Uh, it's in the original circulating uh, collection in the late 18th century. Now on the left hand margin we have something that is uh, entirely consistent with the reader we've already met. This reader um, says here, running up the side, uh, I have heard it has been said of Mr. Hume that he thought there was no deity, but I say he was a fool and will find to his cost that there is one. He was a deist, never read Hume's England uh, the principles will contaminate you. And I think the really crucial thing is the beginning of that sentence, I have heard it has been said. And as you can see, this, um, this comment then provokes, in itself provokes a flurry of critical responses in several hands, some of whom are agreeing, most of whom are pushing it back against that first annotation. Um, one reader retorts that the person who wrote the above lines can be no other than a fool, no doubt of the religion he ridicules and writes against. And then we go to the top of the next page, 
Um, we have uh, uh, an additional <laughs> retort in pencil. I do not think there is any contamination to be had from reading Q. So there's a lot less, uh, the, it's a lot less straightforward now. This, and once Hugh has removed this material, um, readers uh, are generally quite confused as to why he has this general reputation uh, for being dangerous to read. And in fact, in the wider landscape, uh, Hume's <coughs> Editorial Rescue Act had the desired effect. Uh, by the mid-60s, and he writes about this in his autobiographical account, uh, by the mid-1760s, the history was being very widely praised by reviewers as, quote, one of the best histories which modern times have produced, and as the go-to national history that England had always needed. Hume's history, uh, as the collection here very, uh, very clearly documents, appeared in a dazzling number of editions, priced and formatted for different parts of the market. So on the right-hand side, you have your very luxurious quarter editions. In the middle, your octavo, it's a little bit more affordable. And then your paper bound, um, do a decimo on the left-hand side, um, show this, this book is one that is, is filtering down the social sphere. It's also spreading internationally. Uh, so uh, we have the first German edition, 1762. There's a French edition here in the middle from 1763. Um, there's even an Italian uh, excerpt um, from 1767 uh, here in the collection, um, showing the, the international dissemination of, of this work. Um, back in Britain and America, its documented owners included merchants, lawyers, doctors, teachers, civil servants, drapers, builders, grocers, hatters, ironmongers, lumbermen, shoemakers, master cutlers, and tailors. And while ownership of Hume's history extended quite far down the social scale, it was also held by virtually every voluntary membership library, subscription library, and book club for which catalog evidence survives in towns and villages across the Anglo folk world. Um, also, in the very few examples where we have um, borrowing records from uh, 18th century libraries, Hume's history consistently is amongst those texts that are being most widely borrowed. Uh, so this is just two examples on this screen, the Bristol Library Society, and on the right-hand side, the um, Wigton Library, in a tiny uh, market town in the southwest corner of Scotland, where it's being borrowed by farmers, by a miller, by an innkeeper, by a tailor, uh, and by a, a, a very bookish collection of widows. Um, <laughs> uh, this is this is a slight. This this is something that's more to do with my 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 broader book project, uh, but this shows um, this is the New York. Um, it's a social library, um, the New York, sorry, New York Society Library. Um, the grey line here is the average book in the collection and its circulation. Uh, the blue line is Hugh. So you can see even in, after independence, 1780s, this, this is where no records survive. Uh, but up here into the 19th century, Hume's history is still a very, very, very widely read book in New York. The black line, by the way, is given and the other mm. coloured lines are, are Robertson's three main histories. Now for intellectual hist conventional intellectual historians, um, the physical circulation and distribution of a book acts as a proxy for the influence of the ideas contained within it. My current project aims to do two things. First, to establish both the extent to which contemporary readers actually understood and engaged with the ideas embedded in a text like Hume's history. And second, to understand not necessarily what Hume was intending to be taken from his book, but what readers did with it, what it meant from readers' perspective, what the book communicated to the reader, which bits of historical information they chose to copy down and comment on, and how far their engagement with the book was conditioned by the situation in which they encountered it. And in this case, there is a relatively simple and quotidian explanation for why Hume's history was so very widely read. And this has very little to do with the nuances of Hume's writing as an Enlightenment thinker. In, instead, in an age where only the classical historians of ancient Greece and Rome were taught routinely uh, in formal environments at schools and universities, 
Hume's history was actually um, a key uh, text for those who wanted to find out about modern history, to find out about modern British history. And it's read quite systematically as part of informal, do-it-yourself educational reading projects within domestic settings. It's providing that base level of knowledge and useful information about history. Look, for instance, at the advice on learning history uh, by famous elocutionist and pedagogical writer Thomas Sheridan, writing at the end of the 1760s, emphasising both the need for students to familiarise themselves with the national past and the role of his Hume's history as the most profitable way of doing so. So as our own history is that which chiefly imports us to know, Hume's history cannot be read too often nor with too much attention. And this not only because it is the clearest and most impartial of any produced so far, but because of the goodness of the style which will improve the taste of the boys in English composition. <laughs> and not only did readers have to familiarise themselves with post-antiquity history, um, Sheridan's plan then goes on to demonstrate that they were also encouraged to read histories in a very specific way, copying down uh, bits of text that particularly interested them, storing them away for future reflection and reading. <coughs> uh, after having read it with care, he says, each boy should be employed in making an abstract of it from the time of the contest, taking notice only of the most material facts without entering into the spirit of parties, policies, or intrigues of the time. So one of the principles of which I'm working in the book I've uh, just finished writing is that each surviving commonplace book is a single reader's self-made encyclopedia of material facts, to use Sheridan's phrase, that they found most interesting or thought would one day be useful to them. Each abstract abridgment or manuscript digest is a single reader's own edition of the text that they wanted to summarise, the text that they're reading. And in these circumstances, the narrative intent of the author is often subverted, ignored, forgotten, with historical information placed instead in knowledge landscapes largely of each reader's own design. And I'll illustrate uh, in a moment what I mean by this. So when Sheridan's talking about abstracts, manuscript abstracts, there, there's actually many hundreds of these surviving uh, in archival repositories, compiled by both women and by men, documenting the ways by which 18th century readers acquired material facts from the books they read. And as these two examples show, they range very widely in scope and content, and extend pretty much across the literate social scale. So on the left-hand side, we have a simple king list compiled by a Welsh shoemaker, which is providing the reader with a very basic sense of the outline of constitutional development. On the right-hand side, we have detailed study notes on Hume's history compiled by the future George III as he prepared in the late 1750s for the awesome responsibility of government. There's, there's many, many dockets of this um, in, the, in the newly digitised royal papers. Um, and in this instance, uh, it's the opening of the reign of James I where Hume is commenting on the very peaceful transition between Tudors to Stuarts, something that a future king might be interested in emulating. Um, this next uh, example shows the sort of abstract Sheridan has in mind. It's compiled uh, by David Boyle, a teenage law student, reading Hume in the summer before starting his postgraduate uh, legal studies at Glasgow University <coughs> with uh, John Miller. Uh, Boyle's approach is both passive and relatively comprehensive. He works sequentially through Hume's text in his own words, attempting to capture in prose that looks very much like the modern student's bullet points um, the most important bits of information from the passage without leaving anything of no doubt. And this provides him ultimately with a directory of basic information which he'd later expect to deploy uh, in his career in the law courts, in Parliament, and perhaps also in polite conversation where this sort of stuff is thought to be useful and valuable. Um, while Boyle's approach is relatively uh, reasonably passive, others are much more interventionist and selective in their note-taking. And it is their editorial decisions, the choices they make about what to include and what to leave out from their abstracts, that reveal most clearly where readers found reading 
sorry, found meaning in Hume's history. Um, and some of this is, is fairly predictable. So ship captains and navy officers turn out to be particularly interested in copying, copying out notes on maritime history uh, and the age of discovery. Uh, lawyers hunt down historical information on the introduction and evolution of specific legislation. We even have examples of drapers and silk merchants scouring Hume for material on the history of their own trades and the wider history of the commercialization of English towns. And of course, historical information has specific applications in the practice of politics. Um, so there are many examples like this, but this is um, a particular example here comes from a series of notebooks compiled by a fairly anonymous backbench MP who in the early 18 teens is struggling to discover a political voice. Uh, the notes show him assiduously collecting historical information that he's using to cast light and they're entered under, under headings including um, Catholic emancipation, the regency, the civil list, the reform of the Cornwalls and other momentous political issues of the day. The example I've put on the slide here is a little bit different. It's a note taken from Hume on the personal qualities uh, of Elizabeth's chief minister, William Cecil. It speaks to the sort of, high, sort of capacity high leadership requires and fits very neatly with this reader's situation at the very early stage in his career. Uh, let you have a read while I have a drink. <coughs> this reader, by the way, is William Lamb, who becomes um, Viscount Melbourne and is remembered chiefly as uh, Queen Victoria's Prime Minister and, and comfort. History, of course, had more personal meanings uh, still. So this next example shows that some 18th century history readers are driven by the same sort of motivations as those um, celebrity participants in the genealogy TV series, <coughs> Who Do You Think You Are? And I think this has spread beyond Britain, so I hope that's a, a link you get uh, in Canada. And they're looking for historical evidence for, for their family's interests and, and activities. Um, now, this is obviously related to the rise of genealogy in the 18th century and the related economic advantages of being able to prove your lineage and prove who you are. These are all uh, cultural, um, uh, cu this, this is cultural capital, um, of course. But in this case, uh, and I'll let you again have a, have a little, little read before I explain a bit more. Horace St. Paul, uh, the compiler here, um, has very specific and pressing reasons for being interested in his ancestors' turbulent relationship with the crown. Um, so St. Paul, uh, and this is one of a, uh, three or four excerpts like this in, in his reading notes. Um, Horace and Paul um, had been banished for fighting a duel uh, in 1751. He's a, he's a barrister um, and he has a rush of blood to the head and uh, kills someone in a duel. Um, he then went into exile in the Holy Roman Empire and became a leading military officer and served with distinction. And at the time that he's compiling he, these notes from Hume, he's actively lobbying the crown for a royal pardon. So this fits very, very neatly with his personal biography at the time of reading. And while readers were therefore quite adept at picking out material from Hume that had specific personal or professional meanings for them, the meanings of historical information and narratives changed when these books were encountered in radically new contexts, both in time and space. One run of the mill digest of key events in English history turned at the renewal of hostilities between Britain and Napoleon in France in 1802 into a desperate and increasingly urgent quest to catalogue English military successes in the past. Um, as if the reader thinks that his knowledge of victory at Agincourt and Cressy is going to hold off Napoleon for a little bit longer. Um, again, in the, in the run-up to the Anglo-Irish Union of 1800, several Anglo-Irish peers um, are running around Hume collecting evidence of, of England's turbulent relationships with her neighbours over history. So um, Edward I's um, repeatedly duplicitous dealings with Wales and Scotland uh, Henry II's conquest of Ireland, uh, and, and one of the single most extracted um, uh, passages from Hume that I found is actually 
um, his little footnote discussion of Edward Poynings, um, who's, a, who's a Tudor civil servant and gives his name um, to the Poynings legislation, the Poynings law, that is, is one of those controversial British tools for ruling Ireland um, that, is, that is the target of much patriot political reform in the 1780s. Um, Hume's volumes on medieval England could even be used to inform British imperial entanglements overseas. So this is the powerful East India Company diplomat Sir Charles Mallet, uh, and he's noting down two episodes from Hume's account of the War of the Roses, including this one where the Duchess of Gloucester is accused of employing witchcraft against Henry VI. Plucked from his memory bags, this short extra appears in a dense portfolio of notes dealing with administrative affairs in the court of the Noir. Um, and he writes it down because he's, he's put in mind of these episodes by uh, a, a, a trial in 1791 uh, where magic um, and uh, superstition had been a key part of the argument against the, um, the plotters. And this reinforces Mallet's belief that Indian religious and legal cu cu culture needed profound modernization. How lamentably similar, he says, are the effects of malice and ignorance amongst men the most distant in time and situation and the most different in their immoral uh, times and manners. Um, uh, Mallet occupied several pivotal diplomatic posts in the 1780s and 90s, uh, and his conviction that Indian culture needed to improve, um, which is framed in part, obviously, through reading Hume's account of medieval superstition here, um, is to have a powerful influence on the move towards a more expansionist policy under Duke of Wellington. So this is a, this is a very, very powerful reader of Hume, using Hume to quite surprising um, applications. Historical precedences, uh, precedents were particularly useful, as we know, to American colonists as they start to negotiate uh, for themselves the turbulent politics of the 1760s and 70s. Um, I know the text on these two slides gets quite small, so don't worry about reading this out. I will quote the key bits. Um, here we have the first entry in a commonplace book begun by New Hampshire clergyman, later historian, uh, Jeremy Belknap on the eve of revolution in 1774. And it contains a single passage from Hume's account of the origin of the civil wars. In the original passage uh, that he's, he's including in full here, um, Hume criticizes Charles I for pursuing the full extent of his powers without realizing that events of the previous decades, particularly the unprecedented encroachment by Parliament on the royal prerogative that Hume thinks was allowed by James I, had substantively changed the constitutional balance between Crown and Parliament. And Belknap then makes the highly unusual step of spelling out at length, and I'll explain why he might be interested in doing this, precisely why he had copied down this passage. Much the same, he said, is the case in the controversy between Great Britain and the colonies concerning the right of taxation. Um, going on to explain in very, very rich detail that the American crisis comes down to competing definitions of the British Constitution, just as had been the case in the 17th century. And though, as we get down to the concluding paragraph, and though, as in the case of Charles above mentioned, appearances arising from some former precedents when the Constitution was less well understood and not precisely defined may be sufficiently strong in favour of the Parliament in this crisis. Yet our public liberty, as Americans, is so precarious under this exorbitant prerogative that opposition in us is not only excusable but laudable. So this um, extract reveals not only that American readers were quite capable of grasping the full nuance, and many readers I'm talking about clearly don't get what Hume is trying to do. This reader clearly does get what Hume is trying to say, that the Civil War were caused not by one party acting beyond their constitutional rights, but by contempt competing definitions of constitutional right, both of which were based in some measure of fact. So Belmont clearly gets that. Um, 
But it also shows how the extract from Hume is helping Belknap work out for himself, and perhaps from, uh, for others, as I'll, back, I'll, I'll go on to say, how he's going to go about responding to the developing crisis. <clears throat> and Belknap's highly politicised reading of uh, the Amer um, where am I? Sorry. Yes, Belknap's highly politicised reading of Hume, um, utterly divergent from what Hume himself thought of the American crisis in his dying days. Um, Hume uh, doesn't think very much of what the Americans are trying to claim. It's significant in two further respects. Um, the first is that reading was very rarely a solitary activity at this time. Readers' responses to books were shared uh, <clears throat> and negotiated with a very wide range of other readers, and the sociable spaces in which 18th century books were read and talked about, uh, the drawing room, the fireside in the family, the tavern, the club, the debating room, the, the pavement, um, these sociable spaces mean that other readers were an important force in shaping how books were received, understood, <coughs> and appropriated in specific communities. And in fact, in Belknap's case, there is circumstantial evidence that this highly articulate working out of what Hume is doing and how it applies to the current crisis actually has a powerful role potentially in drumming up local support within New Hampshire for the Declaration of Rights that the Continental Congress had just uh, proposed against the Intolerable Acts of 1774. It sounds far-fetched, but on the very next page, after he's finished working out what Hume means, um, immediately following this discussion, Belknap records a meeting with John Sullivan, um, who had freshly returned the previous week from serving as New Hampshire's delegate at the Continental Congress. Uh, and the two are having a meeting um, as soon as John Sullivan's back. And the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of these two, the meeting and the, the worked out analysis of Hume in this commonplace book come diary suggests quite strongly, I think, that it, the historical precedent that he's taking from Hume, um, as he then works out so fully and shows all of his working on paper, um, is, is intended to be used in this meeting uh, with Sullivan to strategize about how they're going to go about convincing other local uh, notables to, to support the Declaration of Rights that uh, Sullivan is coming back to New Hampshire to um, campaign for. Belknap's engagement with Hume also prompts the simple but significant observation that readers' responses to specific texts did not necessarily remain fixed in time. Instead, the reading methodologies employed by 18th century readers uh, are allowing uh, or allow an individual's engagement with a text to be active, dynamic, uh, and constantly evolving over time. In Belknap's case, uh, we have incontrovertible evidence that he already knew Hume's history very well by the time he starts the 1774 commonplace book with this mm. extra. Um, he had compiled a 40-page summary digest of Hume, just like Sheridan has envisaged readers were going to do, 10 years earlier, which is remarkably apolitical. It's one of these that simply goes through chronologically the list of kings and queens and with a very brief summative account of their reigns. Um, and this original digest, the 40 pages of notes from Hume, appear in a commonplace book begun when Belknap graduated from Harvard in 1762, at precisely the time that um, uh, David Boyle in Glasgow is, is copying notes from Hume, as an informal supplement to further theological study. Um, this early and commonplace book is entirely conventional. It's dedicated to religious learning, accumulation of standard knowledge, which will be useful in Belknap's ministry. But as the 1760s proceed, and as he very slowly fills out this commonplace book, it becomes increasingly secularised, and the notes that he chooses to take down become increasingly politicised. So that by the time he finishes the first commonplace book, and starts this second one in 1774 with the extract from Hume, Belknap is almost exclusively focused in his reading on politics and on the turbulent relationship with Britain. So by the time he penned the fully worked up commentary on Hume, 
Belknap was no longer the impressionable student of the first commonplace book, but was more politically engaged and more to the point occupied a much more important leadership role in his local community. He's gone from being a, a trainee clergyman to being the first preeminent minister um, in, in his town and in, in the wider colony. Um, Belknap's return to Hume's history uh, after this 10 year break is not particularly uh, unusual. And we have many further examples where additional information is added um, at, a later, um, uh, at a later date, often setting historical reading notes previously acquired against new political context. Um, and in the 10, 10 minutes or so I've got left, I want to work through one final example in more detail because it sheds light on how Hume's interpretation of constitutional history uh, was received in Britain itself um, in the run-up to the Reform Act debates of the 1820s. So as British political culture is changing radically from that with which Hume was familiar and to which Hume was writing. So this is one of many historical notebooks compiled by Newcastle manufacturer uh, and Member of Parliament William Ord. Probably soon after he entered Parliament at, the, at a very young age of, of, of 21. Uh, running to fully 300 manuscript pages uh, on the recto side of the notebook, Ord digests large chunks uh, of Hume's text, much of it with a political or diplomatic bent. Don't worry, I will be damn it. And it's a very scrawl, scrawly hand. Um, so on this page, uh, on the right hand side, Ord is whipping through key landmarks in the turbulent politics of the 1630s. He notes Thomas Wentworth at the top, you might be able to make that up, is, a, is a, 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 a elevated or created to Earl of Stafford. Uh, he talks about the rise of Lord, and then he talks about the King, levies duties and taxes by his own authority alone, subscriptions for rebuilding St Paul's, the Puritans averse to it, duties on cards, monopolies granted. All of this is entirely compiled to Hume's text. There's no critical intervention or commentary. It's simply providing useful information, uh, background knowledge, bullet point form, uh, albeit it is rather more selective than, than the example we looked at uh, earlier from um, Boyle, in that he's leaving out quite a lot of the narrative. You can tell that by the fact that he's covered seven years in, in half a page. And if we were just to consider this side of the notebook, all extracts would not, uh, uh, would not look unlike, sorry, that's far too many negatives, would, much, would look much like uh, very hundreds of other surviving examples of constitutional directories of British parliamentary history. There's many, 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 many examples of this. In this instance, however, Ord returns repeatedly to the digest filling out the verso side of the notebook with additional information come culled from other histories read more recently, uh, and with information correcting or undermining Hume's interpretation of events. So the two comments on the verso side uh, in this image point out uh, the, the first one, the enormity strangely passed over by Hume, uh, and then take issue with Hume's suggestion that the flight of the Puritans in 1634 concerned theological rather than political reasons. And he says, well, surely they have political evils fully sufficient to fly from. Um, so you are already beginning to get the tone of this. This page gives you a sense of the sheer materiality mm -hmm. of this ongoing engagement and shows how dramatic Ord's reworking of the constitutional directory abstract becomes. The verso side is packed with supplementary information, critical invective, entered, you can tell, in different inks uh, and at different times, all key to specific parts of Ord's original notes from Hugh. So all of these little asterisks uh, are him updating specific mm. parts of the text, um, adding things from things that he's read recently. Um, or, um, so, uh, all to note at the bottom of this page, here we are, uh, pointing out the extraordinary observation of Hume that the general tenor of Charles' entire administration wants somewhat of being entirely legal, 
helps us unlock why he invested so much energy in updating Hume in this way. Because it gets the absolute crux of what Hume was trying to do. Writing as he was in the aftermath of the defeat of the Jacobites in 1745, <coughs> Hume wanted to forge a new, more consensual politics by neutralising poisonous disputes between Whigs and Tories <coughs> about who was to blame for the constitutional upheavals of the past, not least the civil wars. Uh, British politics in the 1750s, as Hume sees it, is still crippled by these ideological assumptions about the past that were largely mythical. In the case of the Civil War, Hume wants to show that both Parliament and the Crown are responsible for the breakdown of the social order. And it's therefore crucial for Hume to show that Parliament was at least as culpable as Charles in the outbreak of the Civil War. And this is why Hume says that Charles, it's a, it's a bit of a concession, okay, Charles, his behaviour is somewhat, uh, wants somewhat of being entirely legal, but you know, he's, he's acting sort of within his rights, is what Hume said. Now, while Belknap finds this uh, incredibly useful in helping to articulate the case for rebellion in America, what Ord's more mature comments on this episode, um, uh, and I mean more mature because he's developing these ideas over 20 years, uh, reveal is how unthinkable Hume's reading uh, of the 17th century is becoming for a generation of political readers looking uh, to reclaim central tenets of Whig Whiggish ideology um, in the context of the debates around reform. Um, and by doing so, they're hoping to cast parliamentary reform as the next great step in British <coughs> constitutional destiny. Um, and British readers find consistent, um, that I find consistent in the work that I've done on, on, on readers' notebooks, that they really don't like the nuance uh, that Hume is trying to introduce into this Whig Tory battle, because they find it's going to dilute the case for parliamentary reform mm -hmm. and actually enhance and embolden the radical case for just throwing it all out and starting again. Um, the reformers want there to be something. Um, uh, ideological and, and, and permanent about British liberty. Um, this, this much is clear when we turn to the very end of Ord's, uh, Ord's notes from Hume. Um, and, Hume and, and the original notes from Hume, again on the right hand side, uh, culminate in a terse narrative summary of William's character, the settlement in Scotland, the English Convention of 1688, and then this, this very simple, deceptively simple statement a declaration of rights is annexed to this settlement and the powers of royal prerogatives circumscribed. So in Hume's view, as ably summarised uh, by the youthful Ord, this was the point at which the age-old contest between Crown and Parliament had finally been settled. It was neither the mythical, legendary ancient constitution of the Anglo-Saxons, nor the, the wondrous Magna Carta that had bequeathed 18th century Britain's famous constitutional liberties but the pragmatic revolutionary settlement of 1688, which brought to a close a generation of unprincipled squabbling between parliamentarians and divine right monarchists, both of whom, Hume says, have at times uh, acted unlawfully and usurped the power of the other. Crucially, when Ord comes to write his second conclusion to this notebook, his later revisions don't engage at all with this original conclusion. You'll see that we, we're now lacking the sort of asterisk uh, cross-references. Um, and it, what he does is he enters instead a two-page narrative summation, this is the second page, on the verso side, uh, which draws very heavily from Henry Hallam's more conventionally Whiggish History of Europe in the Middle Ages, published in 1818. So this is fully uh, 16, 17 years after Ward is originally reading Hume. And in doing so, he sets aside once and for all the more nuanced reading of the British past that Hume had so carefully laid out for future generations of readers, privileging in its place a thoroughly Whiggish account of constitutional history. The belief, and again, I'll, I'll read out the important bits, the, the belief that there was indeed a permanent strongly marked principle of civil, civil liberty always existing from the Anglo-Saxon constitution onwards. 
um, that this had survived the Norman conquest um, and gradually gained strength and uh, perfection in the century since. And that, skipping to the end, um, uh, um, that moderate parliamentary reform supported, I've not picked it out actually, but supported by the power of public opinion in the best present times, um, is, is the next logical step towards the further perfection of the British Constitution, perfection of this thing that is peculiar and unique to, to England. Okay, so what do we what do we make of all this? But although it's not normally considered as such, there are strong grounds for regarding Hume's history as one of the most influential pedagogical texts of the uh, Georgian period. And actually, as the collection here shows, well into the 19th century, um, it was consistently recommended by professional reviewers, literary critics, conduct writers, and didactic novelists, as we were talking about in the class this morning as the best guide to English history yet written. While amateur readers regularly included in diaries, correspondence, manuscript commonplace books, abridgments, and abstract. Or, uh, and this is just a bit that I've thrown in to, to show something that I've found uh, this week, um, or, or it's also something that fires their imagination. Uh, so this is, this is a, an entirely unexpected sketch um, that's entered at the very back of one of the volumes of Hume's history here at McGill. Um, and this is something you find uh, again and again in copies of Hume. Um, so this is um, a Bristol, a young Bristol girl's uh, reading notes from mm -hmm. Hume. Um, it depicts Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, and on the facing page, there is an extract from Hume's narrative life of Mary, Queen of Scots. So the, the text inspires this imagination. Uh, in, uh, this creative um, um, engagement, um, as well as all of these political engagements that I've been talking about. So this is a book that virtually everybody in late Georgian Britain who wanted knowledge about the national past would have read. And they did so because the act of reading Hume was very clearly rich with meaning. Historical information equips readers to understand political, cultural, social, personal, professional realities. It helps them to think about where they stood within a rapidly changing world. So whether they read Hume against the demise of the Jacobite rebels, the anti-Catholic riots of 1780, the, the Irish rebellion of 1798, or the Reform Act debates of the 1820s. And the note-taking practice this, they employed, uh, the commonplace book, the manuscript of Bridgement, and all of these, these copies uh, that I've been talking about, encourage them to tailor the text towards their own interests, values, and perspectives, uh, adapting, appropriating, sometimes refuting entirely Hume's original intentions in the face of new information, changing circumstances, and later readings. And apart from anything else, this means that their Hume was not necessarily our Hume, or his Hume, for that matter. Each of the readers discussed in the paper uh, in my paper today, we made the text physically in some way, often in ways that render it uh, almost wholly unrecognizable. And I think this helps explain why Hume, in the comments with which we started tonight, is so keen to prepare his future readers uh, for what lay ahead of them when they opened the book. Hume was one of these readers. He's rooted in the culture of reading by copying and extracting that I've been talking about. And so he's well aware with the, uh, of the sort of liberties readers might take with his books. So when he's talking about the one cry of reproach, disapprobation, and even detestation from all of these different quarters, mm. uh, which met the release of history of the history of England, Hume, I think, is daring future readers to look beyond the conventional, well-publicized criticisms. He knows that they're out there. He's telling the readers that this is a difficult book. Uh, but he's wanting them to engage with the book uh, on its own terms before they then start to think about pulling it apart for their commonplace books and manuscript abridgments. So this, I think, is a hopeful Hume trying to influence what readers are going to do with the book. Unfortunately for Hume, then, in the case of William Ward, certainly, uh, and many of the other readers that I've looked at, it's the reader's own version 
of the text. Their own um, appropriated, manipulated, heavily edited version of the text that matters to them. And in William Auld's notebooks, we see how powerful a pedagogical and political tool the manuscript abridgment could become. It allows us to trace processes of active rereading, critical intertextuality over a period of at least 20 years that fundamentally reshaped Hume's original text and retooled it for a new constitutional landscape. Leave it there. What a terrifically rich history of the book and history of its reception. So I know that you have some burning questions that you'd like to ask, and Mark has agreed to entertain some questions, but before we do that, I want to give the floor to um, Rare Books librarian Anne-Marie Holland, who is responsible for pulling together the exhibit that Mark has mentioned a few times. And so we just want her to introduce some of, some of the things that you'll be able to see in the little exhibit case around the corner. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you, Mark Hampton, for such an interesting talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, so we moved beyond the text of, of Hume, which is most often studied and talked about, um, to present to you today some of the um, aspects regarding readership um, through Marx and books. And we have several pieces of evidence of Marx and books, and one of the most fabulous is the armored fellow. <laughs> Um, full page, so that is in the exhibition case. Um, we also have marks in books as regards to library evidence, circulation, provenance, accession labels. These all give dates of when our items actually were um, brought into our collections. Um, I have noticed a, a date because of being able to witness over the last couple of days with Professor Towsey many examples from our human collection. Um, it is in the era of university librarian Richard Pennington where I'm noticing a lot of acquisitions, accessions, um, and uh, this is in the, the 1940s. You all know about the famed copy perhaps of the Cicero um, two-volume two set um, found by Dr. Raymond Klebanski in the Faculty Club cupboard in 1946, um, which was somewhat the start of Hume building uh, in the McGill Library, building collections, and um, Richard Ver in the back is, is very notable for his recent acquisitions of Hume. Um, oh, I wanted to just mention that in this regard, um, it's, it's the starting point of McGill's Hume collection, built with Richard Pennington, obviously, continued by Richard Ver. Um, and it is today considered to be one of the largest repositories of Hume's <coughs> works and related materials, we believe, outside of Edinburgh, Hume's native city. So um, these materials are exciting. They're vast. They're deep. Um, we have proof of, of how wide um, uh, scope we have and are very proud of this uh, collection and very proud to have um, Professor Towsey on board to um, <coughs> confirm, I guess, the depth and the richness of our uh, of our collections. Um, we did a small, just to end, we did a small little um, a view of portraits and frontispieces of David Hume this time also, which is new and part of a new book, um, Multigraph. Perhaps you've noticed a new book in uh, the history of the book entitled Multigraph. Professor Brian Cowan has been a contributor to that recent book, and there's a whole chapter on frontispieces. So these are new approaches to book history and are very, very exciting, and we're happy to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bonnie. I'm actually going to invite Mark to come back to the microphone because we want to hear from him, not from me. Um, but we, we have a few minutes now for, for questions. Yeah, I'll ask a, a sort of question that I detest being asked when I give papers, so I apologize in advance. Yeah, there's so much uh, you've given us uh, that engages. But I wonder if, if you'd mind uh, 
giving us the benefit of, of all your work in going through the notebooks to, uh, to cast back now on to Hume's text to try and ascertain where he most engaged his readers at different points in the uh, period under discussion and, and what su might surprisingly be points that didn't engage readers. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it, so, so, so one of the surprising ones that, that's really contemporaneous, what I mentioned in the talk, was the, uh, um, the discussion of Poynings. Um, Edward Poynings, who's a, who's a Tudor civil servant, and it's a very, very obscure bit in the text. Um, <laughs> but it becomes very, very political, politically important in the 1770s and 80s, because that that's what allows England to control the Irish Parliament and control the Irish Parliament discusses. So it becomes a really, really important bit of political discussion at the time. Um, and that is a passage that turns up time and again. And that's the sort of passage that I think you're talking about, a passage that I wasn't expecting to see coming up very often. Um, and then it, is, it, it, it really is just coming up time and again. Um, the, 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 the passages that, that really engage are are also in part the passages that Hume wants to really engage. So the um, encounter and the contest between Queen Elizabeth and uh, Mary Queen of Scots uh, is, is one that, is, uh, is, that, that readers um, follow very, very closely uh, and almost always appears in, in readers' notebooks. Whether uh, they're Victorian or 18th century readers? Yeah, uh, I mean, what so. If, if we push it into the Victorian age, um, and there are writers who, whose histories of the, the encounter between Mary Queen of Scots and, and Queen Elizabeth use a lot of the same words and stories that Hume and his colleague Robertson are using. Um, and it also becomes um, the setting for sort of imaginative works and novels and, and dramas. And things. Um, so that, that, that is something that is very, very engaging to people. Um, I've also got examples, uh, and I, you know, it's it's you know sh presumed to shed a generous tear for the fact that Charles I. People do join in and shed a generous tear for Charles I. So you can see them doing it. You can mm. you can see them paying attention to when he's crying and things like this, and, and really take that on board. Um, in terms of um, what I was expecting to see and didn't see. Um, I might have to think a bit more about that and come back to you if I can. Um, I, I'm more, I'm more at the moment completely in the zone of what I did see. Um, well, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. No, not at all. Um, I'm sure you'll come to me and I'll find you afterwards. And quite, there are quite a few questions, so we're going to go to the back. Can you go to the gentleman in the back first, and then there's a woman. <coughs> Yes, I'm, I'm curious about how you see uh, the relation between his actual readers and the readers he imagined. Uh, there's this um, essay uh, written by Hume of the study of history, written in the 40s, where he distinguishes three kinds of persons, the businessman, the man of ordinary life, yeah. the philosopher, and the historian, meaning both the writers of history and the readers of history. And he says, well, the historic, the philosophers are too cold and too impartial, yeah. so that they're not moved by anything and not engaged yes. by anything. The ordinary man is too immersed in yeah. practical life to be impartial. And history fosters the kind of point of view that would let a, a weak uh, to shed, nevertheless, a generous tear for the faith of Charles, Charles I. So I wonder whether uh, you see a gap between the way Hume thought uh, uh, of views of history yeah. and the actual views of history. I think definitely. I think Hume, uh, I think Hume expect, uh, expects too much <coughs> of his readers when he's, when he's trying to play these very fine analytical games around the sort of Whig interpretation and a more Tory or Jacobite interpretation. And you see it in scholarship. It was, mm -hmm. For a very long time, uh, 
scholarship on Hume's history is about trying to prove whether he's a Whig historian or a Tory historian or a Jack Bright historian. Um, and, and these things uh, Hume doesn't want readers to pay attention to, but I think it's human, human nature is that you, you, you are, uh, you, 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 you read to reaffirm what you already think. And I think here, um, sort of theoretical perspectives on reading and reception um, come, and, come and play a role. So things like um, uh, sort of an interpretive community or something like that. And uh, readers who have grown up with a certain way of thinking about the British past and talking to other readers, um, coming across Hume and Hume doesn't fit what they're expecting to see, um, they're going to go with what they already know quite often. Um, this, is, this isn't an ex Hume example, but it's, it's very obviously the example with someone like uh, Dalrymple, um, mm. who just because he, he writes very famously, he discovers the stuff about the 17th century Whig martyrs taking money from the French court, um, simply because mm. that stuff appears in there. There's a whole bunch of readers who see that and just assume he's a Jacobite historian or a Tory historian who's trying to do down um, the Whig, the, the blessed sort of Whig martyrs. Uh, whereas actually, it's, it's as far, far from the truth as you get. Dalrymple's as, as close to a sort of typical Whiggish historian that you get in that generation. So it's a very, very clear disconnect with what they're tr he's trying to do politically, um, mm. uh, which is all to do with, with the, the processes of learning to read and those sociable communities, the political communities within which books are discussed. The other side of the coin is that he gets it he gets it right with the emotions, and he gets it right with um, really pulling in um, people to the narratives uh, and engaging with these people as individuals, the historical characters as individuals. So we play, he plays that very well. Um, it's just when, when he has when he has these difficult arguments, um, and, it, and it's very interesting, by the, by the 1820s and 30s, 40s, 50s, even up to the 1880s, there's a student hue being produced in the, in the 1880s. But it looks nothing like a text that Hume produced. It's been wiggified so relentlessly in the way that a lot of these readers are doing in their own time. The publishers and the editors then start to do it from the 1820s onwards, when you start to get a mass reading public. Um, so I think his... I mean, for me, it's beginning to feel a bit of a tragic story because Hume has these wonderful sort of idealistic ideas about what he wants readers to come away with his, from his text with, and, and uh, ultimately, I think they're frustrated. Does that does that answer what you were asking about? Yeah. There was a question. Yes. Yes. Um, I was kind of struck by the the answer, the Martinelli you showed from Philadelphia, and especially the sort of warning people off. Yeah. What looked to me like a few hundred pages into the book, yeah. saying never read Hume. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if you found other examples of like that very particular type of comment mm -hmm. from readers, sort of mm -hmm. trying to ward off other people from the text. Yeah. Um, that is, this is happening in the first generation of Hume readers. Um, the stuff, in fact, the, the person with whom I started, so mm. if I can go all the way back, if it eventually catches up. Uh, so, I don't know, I can't prove who this is, but I have a fairly good idea who writes this. Uh, and I think it's a woman reader associated one of, with one of the aristocratic estates around Glasgow. Um, and, she comes back to Hume again and again. This is a three-volume commonplace book, as you can probably tell from the reference number. There's three volumes of this, and, and, and she repeatedly cycles back to stuff. Um, and in one episode that makes her do so, she's clearly talking to someone else. And someone else, in fact, it, it is this response. This other person says, but Hume's a historian. He's not a theologian. He's a historian. He's writing history. And this is, this is her response to that. Um, and and you can imagine her saying that. Um, and there are other examples of, um, of, of people writing to um, family members, to friends, and telling them, warning them against you, um, and warning, you, you know, you, may, you, you have this wonderful idea of you, but have you heard of the truth? Have you heard of this despicable book? Now, I've not read this book. I've just read what James Beattie says about it, and you can pick up his book in the local library. 
But James Beattie says this, and frankly, I don't think you should even read the book. Just read what James Beattie says about it. And then you'll know that Hume's history is this evil thing that's going to make you, um, you know, ultimately commit suicide. Um, and there's, there's, there's other examples from the 1790s when, when Hume, Hume's history is much more, uh, I think, by then has, has overcome that barrier and is much more culturally ubiquitous. Um, and you'll have mothers writing to children saying, well, of course, Hume is, Hume is great and you, you should read it and you must read it again and again and it gives you all of this. But don't forget, Hume also made people commit suicide. Uh, you know, he took away their closest, their dearest religious uh, principles and led young people into this, into this utter group. So there's a, there's a very um, uh, interesting balance in the conversations. Um, <coughs> Uh, another thing that I would say about the Philadelphia stuff is the Phili those Philadelphian books, it was a wonderful discovery for this project, but a lot of the books that I'm interested in, the Humes, the Robertsons, Gibbons, Catherine Macaulay, they're packed full of contemporary marginalia mm. in many different hands. Um, it may well be because the library was open to readers, was a bit more open than most subscription libraries. Mm. Perhaps it is also sort of the open to local students, college students, but there is this Perhaps it's something to do with the Philadelphian political culture as well, but they're very contesta contestatory readings um, against the re writer, but then against each other. Um, some of it really not repeatable and not very polite about uh -huh. sheep stealers and blackguards and things like that. <laughs> um, There's one burning question, and we have time for one last question, Sam. You've been discussing Jung's work as a historian. But yet you didn't say anything about his work as a philosopher, which is very much tied with his work as a historian, because Hume believed that there ought not to be any sacred cows, that meaning is to be derived from experience and circumstance, which then belies the comment about the absurdity which turns out that it is the writer of the statement who is absurd, not you. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if there was any, uh, other than time, if there was any reason why you sort of uh, didn't mention any of his philosophical views that are incorporated in the history book. Uh, yeah, so, the, so my project is on, on historical narratives and what readers do with historical narratives. So the philosophical side well, I, you know, it, it's clearly there. Um, it is not something that was really interesting me in this particular project. What I have found um, in previous research and just through knowing the material, and um, over the last ten years, I've I've been to an awful lot of repositories in America, Ireland, Scotland, England, and Wales, so, and I've I've hunted for commonplace books. I, mm. I, I have a fairly good idea what's out there, and there are very very few. Um, readers who engage with the philosophical works in this way, readers who comment on his philosophy um, in this way. That might be because people are taught to read, it may well be because people are really taught to read history in a different way. Um, but it, it, I think it also has to do with this wider uh, image of Hume as the atheist, and, and Hume as the philosopher is a dangerous person um, who's going to lead you astray. Um, and, and that's what I've found, when Hume's philosophy comes up, that's what I've found to be the general response. Although actually one of the things that, that we've put out, and anne put out, is an a annotated um, 1760s edition of the Essays and Treatises, which not only copies across and updates uh, the bit from his own life about the philosophy in the opening page, which I think is the bit he put open, but then in the subsequent pages and the contents page, then has summaries, uh, fairly effective summaries, I think, uh, of some of the main ideas, um, which which is a really interesting copy, um, um, and I might come back to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are other questions, and there'll be a chance to pose them in in the reception that's going to follow. I just. I wanted to introduce our speaker series. If you're interested in some of the other events on the series, do pick up this, this card in the room next door. Um, there are a couple of tips. 
One is that the date for Nicholas Kronk has actually changed, so the, the next event is not as it's listed here, and so it's going to be <coughs> later in April, so just heads up on that. Um, the other one is that um, if you come late, there are two types of chairs in this room, and the ones in the front are actually slightly more comfortable. <laughs> so don't, don't be shy about taking a seat in the front if you come back. Um, and then the last one is that this is a speaker series. It's funded by Shirk. Um, and the whole reason for it was to try and animate our collections and learn about what kinds of research questions could be supported by our collections. And today's talk was just a super example of not only the kind of um, very close and intensive research that, that our Hume collection can support, but also an articulation of what we're trying to do in the war units. And that's we're not only trying to give you access to fabulous books and wonderful material, but we're actually trying to provide a venue for discussion and debate of that material. And so this talk was a wonderful example of that. That, that these rare and special collections units are about engaging, and especially the library in the 21st century, is increasingly about providing space to animate those kinds of discussions. And I want to close on the last note by saying a speaker series like this doesn't happen by itself. And so we are helped with some fabulous um, staff members who are helping to support it. So Jacqueline Sunberg in the back is really responsible for making this happen along with Martha. who is so busy that she's already outside helping to organize the reception. So when you have a chance to, to see them, um, we're very grateful for that kind of support and to Shirk for supporting us. And now without further ado, thanks to Shirk for the reception and do, you're welcome to come back for other events and please enjoy the reception and the conversation with me. Thanks so much. Gracias.